Okay, so let's uh, kind of let's uh, come on. I think actually I got the, I think I, I had to think about it and I think I actually substituted in something that I shouldn't have. I, I did one of the wrong classes last time. Well, let's kind of get down to it. We have the principal class. So I just said that, and we're going to try to get more justification for it. I'm going to use the norm more generally on ideals to kind of help me out here. Probably you asked a question. So like once we verify this, how do we know that there's not others? And that's a very valid question. We're going to get to that later. Uh, but right now I want to show you that for example this class has uh, these two have order uh, Four, this one has order two, and then there's the principal class. Um, recall we, we've mostly talked about this computation from the point of view of elements, but I do believe I did tell you about this with respect to the ideal. So suppose you have three algebraic integers and you have the prime ideal in R that lies over a prime ideal in, in Z, <coughs> right? And recall the norm of the ideal B for little b to the F power, where F to the degrees or mod b as a vector space when we see mod b is right you remember talking about that and in general so this tells you how we define the norm of a prime ideal it's an ideal downstairs at the z level in this case, the principal ideal, because these are principal ideal domain. And how do we do the norm of an ideal in general? The lucky yes in a different domain, you can factor every ideal that touches the prime ideal since you're not necessarily state. And the norm of I is the norm P1 product norm. So, just recalling this here, if we look, let's call this one just A, this is the P bar. Uh, it's easy to check that P intersects Z and P bar intersects Z is the ideal term about three. That's no surprise there because yeah, there's the three in it. <laughs> Right, so the, the intersection of either of these and Z has to be at least the ideal term about three. If it's any bigger, it's the whole range. And it's it's fairly easy to verify that this is a uh, proper ideal. Okay, so Look at the ideal term by three and four as an ideal upstairs in R. This is And let's note that we've already seen the computation of
So now it's much easier to justify that, in fact, Actually, I'll let you get part of how to pay yourself. I was mixed up on this. P to the fourth is one of these, right? This is P to the fourth conjugate, or it's the other way around. Uh, let's see if you can figure out what that is. And notice that What are the possibilities for smaller principal ideals to form P to the K? Well, uh, ideal, uh, say alpha, uh, has so you have alpha is x plus y radical negative 14. And the norm of alpha is x squared plus 14 y squared. So three it's easy to check that three and twenty seven are not possible. You can't represent this by that quadratic angle. So the only possibilities of smaller principal ideals, smaller norm principal ideals, are nine and only the only solution to this uh, that has more nine is for x to be plus or minus three. Y to be zero, uh, and that means that the principal ideal is just the ideal term by three. It's sort of specific for three and minus three. So, what does this mean? Um, what this means is. And uh, by symmetry, what that means is that this has to be uh, one of the two. There's no other way to mix and match these, right? So PP bar is the ideal generated by three, right? Uh, and to have norm, you have to have uh, at least four of these things here. So this sort of justifies the statement here. And of course, what that means is that means that for both P to the four and P bar to the four are principal. So what we've got so far is this is border four, this is border two, these two are inverses. So this one's border four. So what I've really got here is whatever class group of uh, this ring of integers is contains a subgroup that's isomorphic to C4. Now, in, in this case, it's the whole thing. So how, I, again, the question, how do I know some more? We'll get to that uh, pretty soon. So we're saying that those primes of four are principal and then using this argument to say that they know smaller powers. That, that's right, that's right. So, 
let me give you kind of an application of this business about knowing class group. We'll look at a number of these. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to prove this, but we're going to use this as a tool. Uh, theorem 8, 3, 10. Any ring about breaking And again, what I mean by this is the integral closure is the infinite extension of rational numbers. Is that it? We know this. And what is more? Say the class group of R is fine. And number two, uh, every ideal class. Things a, in fact, infinitely many actually, if you have this property, uh, so so you can do these kind of combinatorial factorization arguments. I'm going to look at this for a while. Uh, if you have a uh, if you have a ring of integers, or more generally a dedicated domain that have these two properties, the class group is finite. And in fact, in many cases, you don't even need finite class group; you just need a torsion class group, so everything is finite order. And number two, every ideal class contains a prime. Rings valid break integers very good because the ideal class or the class group is always finite. And every class actually contains in many problems. Um, right. Okay. Now, let me give you a definition here. Yeah. Um, Atomic domain R is a half factorial domain H of G, you know, given. Irreducible factorizations alpha one and alpha two, alpha m equals beta one, beta two, beta n. By irreducible factorizations, I mean all my alphas and betas are irreducible. Then m equals n. So nobody's claiming the factorizations are unique, but whenever you decompose any element, you might be able to do it zillions of ways, you always get the same length of decomposition. Um, we're assuming it's atomic so that everything has a factorization in the first place. It is a, his interesting historical note, first paper written about this topic that was actually called half factorial domains. There was actually two of them with the same title, one in 1976, one in 1980, in the Israel Journal by Abraham Zacks. The original paper did not assume that the domain was atomic, so they just consider wherever you had two various factorizations uh, of an element, if it existed, then it always had to be the same length. The paper does quickly specialize to atomic, but 
the industry standard now is to assume that every HFT is common. Um, anybody, uh, give a, can anybody give an example of an HFT? A UFT? That, I was way yeah. too smart on That's exactly right. Always start with the easy, right? A UFT is certainly an HFT, and we know these. Uh, now, the second thing is, Give yourself an example so you don't feel like an idiot, right? I mean, I'd feel kind of stupid making up this definition if it was equivalent to you, I think, right? The enjoyed the square and make it fun. Right. Um, that, is, that is clearly, uh, that, that's one that would give an example. Can you give me one that you can verify? Mm -hmm. Right, because, yeah, we can do this, but, but we have we have to know something first, right? I, I mean, I, this is just folklore so far. <laughs> Gathered around the campfire. <laughs> right, we're all around the campfire. Uh, here's a, here's an example. Um, let me give this to you concretely. Um, so here's here's a here's a non. And this one, this one's easier to see, I think. Um, let's let's verify this is the case. Now, actually, you can you can play this game with polynomials too, but actually, power series is easier. Um, can anybody tell me? Okay, so whenever you look at factorization, <coughs> you always look at non-zero non-units. I know what a non-zero is. Can anybody tell me what the non-units look like? Unit constant or everything. Okay, so let's uh, so Q0 is, of course, a rational number, and F of X is just some power series with all real coefficients, right? Uh, This is a unit if and only if Q0 is not zero. So, just like the ordinary power series thing, right? Um, you know if Q is zero? Or not, sorry. Right, right. So it's a non unit if and only if Q is zero. So the non units are, well, non zero non units. Uh, that's zero. And in fact, I'm going to generalize this form a little bit in the following sense. So in general, it looks like this, x to the n, f of x, with, uh, perhaps, right? Uh, that's happened to me before. Uh, That's what a general non-zero non-unit looks like. And let's see, just to put this on firm, we'll say F zero is not zero, right? And that way that power series that affects is not from zero power series. So in other words, what have I done? A non-zero non-unit has something there. I pull this out, but maybe it's getting more factors of X. I jerk those out until I finally got something that's got a, um, a non-zero constitute. So notice, uh, I'm going to make the following claim. Uh, X to the N, F of X, here N is greater than one and F of zero is not zero. Uh, is irreducible if and only if anybody want to guess when would this be irreducible 
Okay, I, that's certainly what I hope, right? Let's prove this point. <clears throat> um, I'm going to prove your reducible plus n is one. Let's assume that n is bigger than one and prove that it's reducible. How about that? I'm a lazy, lazy man. Suppose n is bigger than one, then x to n f of x is x times x again minus one f of x. Big smile. All right, so there you go. It's reduced. That's complicated. That's right. <laughs> it's like, hey, I don't like that scene in this class. Easy makes me <laughs> happy. How about the other direction? If n is one, then any factorization has a true height. Uh, suppose um, x and x um, u of x h of x. Suppose this breaks down further, right? And here we point out that f of zero is equal to, um, it's not equal to zero. Okay. So, how do we go from here? Most one of your factors has a factor of x in it. Okay, right. So let, let, let's think of this in a bigger picture here because um, Let's think of this as factorization of our power x, which is a ring that contains our original ring, right? X is prime. X divides g of x without loss of general. Because as an element, I mean, this is, after all, PID, and so x must divide one of these two, so we'll say it divides g of x. So g of x is equal to x g prime of x, uh, and not the derivative. Um, and so what do we have here? Well, now we have x f of x equals x g prime of x times h of x. Notice that we have now e prime of x, h of x equals f of x, and plugging in zero here, I get g prime of zero, h of zero is f of zero, which is not equal to zero. Therefore, both g prime of zero and h prime of zero, or not, not h zero or not equal to zero. Therefore, h of x, uh, well, in particular, h of zero is in q and h of x is in the units of our group. And so, we're done because this decomposition here, where are you decomposition? Right, said that if X divides this one, this other one has to be a unit. Right, so here it is. So now that we know this, 
this if and only if gives by this claim the number of factors in any factorization of x in f of x is precisely n. And there you go, it's an HFD. No matter how you how you try to make this shake out, it's always got exactly the factor by our little observation. Let me convince you it's not a USD. Notice So, for example, I can factor. Now, some of these factorizations are associated to what you would expect x times x, right? For example, you could take one and one, or you could have two and one half, and those are all associates. However, the real's very big. You can also have pi x, pi inverse x, e x, e inverse x, and so forth and so on. So, in particular, x squared has uncountably many different factors. But they're all linked to. Right? In fact, let me give you kind of a little theorem that analyzes this just for fun. Uh, inside K. Then the domains and two always oh. HFD. Um, any construction that's kind of yes, the lambdas to the end, not Q for this to be used. Oh, well, I know. I mean, for example, if you have one, it's, it is a factorization of x squared, right? But for example, as you range through all the rational numbers, these will all be associates, right? So um, there's really no difference in factor x times x and 2x times 1 half x because they vary by a rational number, the associates, right? However, as you branch out into, in fact, the reals have infinite transcendence to clear the rationals. So there are actually uncountably many. Uh, right. I guess it doesn't really, I was just going to say, for it, it's only... If say we were, we were just looking at ones where the lambdas are in the rationals, that wouldn't show that it's not a UFD because they wouldn't be different enough. That, that, that's different. right. If, if all I had working was the rationals here, and see that's that's why we're so clear. That's so right. Clear. If, yeah, if, right. If these two fields are the same, all those factorizations kind of collapse into the same thing. And in fact, these constructions always give HFDs, whether you have polynomial or power series, uh, and They are not QFD, or well, let me let me put it this way. Up. And these domains are UFDs if and only if F and K are the same. If F and K are the same, it's clear they're they're UFDs because they're both PIDs actually. Uh, and that's if and only if, right? 
by the way, is he my give me my give me a quick proof of this? One direction of uh of the big boy king is like a power series, I'm just gonna know it's uh right if F and K are the same. Uh, I know that, that they're the UFD. You might give me a proof that if they're UFDs, then you must have the same. Basically, the same thing you did over here. Right. Take an element that's. Here's another quick way to see this. Let K be in K, but not an F. And consider if I collectively call these all our way. Notice that K X to the N power became all our for all of I agree with that? But K is not in R. Because I'm equal to be here. So R is not completely enclosed. But all you have these are completely enclosed. So it's impossible. The thing you're powering, the thing that you're powering. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you. That's uh, the typo. Oops. There we go. Thank you. Yes. But fortunately for me, it still works. Is why pi and e freak you out so much? What's that? Is why pi and e freak you out so much? Or me? Right. So if you have pi to the end, times x always, yeah. I have my I have too. Um, so let me give you one of the sweetest theorems that you will ever come across. Um, the theorem I'm giving you in the original paper. Uh, wasn't stated exactly this way because the theorem actually predates the terminology. Let R be a ring of integers. And we'll see from the proof this actually extends a little bit more generally. Then R is an HFD. If and only if the order of the class group of R is less than or equal to two. This theorem This is the famous paper that appeared by Leonard Carlos, Proceeds of American Mathematical Society, uh, in 1960. Um, I love this paper for a number of reasons. Number one, no nonsense, right? This paper is like a page and a half, right? You get in there, you get out, beautiful result, you go to the house, fantastic. Number two, and I love to jam this one in Dean's faces, uh, the paper itself went unnoticed for many, many years, right? Between its publication and maybe around 1980, one, maybe two citations. Uh, like the Zach's paper in, um, well, I, both Zach's papers, seven, six, and eight, by reference to. And then in 1990, it started picking up citations 30 years after publication, right? I mean, 30 years, right? I mean, that's six generations of psychology papers being discredited, right? And they just started to reference this one, right? And it's got literally over 100 citations, right? So that's that's one of the things I love to chit chat about these. This is a 
uh, a wonderful result. So let's uh, let's do let's prove this. So and actually, this theorem says something else because we already know that a ring of integers is UFD if and only if the order of the class group is one, if the class group is trivial. So actually, the theorem tells me even more because what it does, not only does it tell me when I have HFDs, but it breaks it up into a couple of nice easy pieces for me. Class number one, UFD. Class number two, HFD that's not a UFD. Right. So what happens if class number plus number two? If That was easy enough. Uh, so suppose so that is to say <coughs> I don't know much, but I know that if you have group two or two, it's C minus two, plain and simple. And what that means, that means something very interesting. This means that this means if you have any idea in R, it's not zero, then one of two things is true. So I don't see the principle already, or I squared is principle. And in fact, if I and J are non-principle, then I J is principle. You gotta love class number two, right? Multiply two non-principles are both in the in the unique non-principle class, their product has to be the identity. So principle. Am I okay with that? Okay. So what we're trying to do is show that R is an HFD. And I'm going to use these observations. So let's suppose. We have uh, two irreducible factorizations of an element in R. So these are going to be irreducible factorizations. Let's say A1, A2, AM equals B1, B2. And of course, our ultimate goal is to show that M and N are the same. Okay. We first assume no A, I, or B, J is prime. So these are all irreducibles that are not prime. Why is it that, uh, why is it that I can make that assumption? That's right. You got to dig primes because if a let's say just for giggles that a one is a prime, well, it has to divide this other side, which means it has to divide one of these things. So it means a one is over here, and we just pull it off, and now you short the length by one, and you haven't changed anything really. So I'm assuming that primes cancel on both sides, so they're all gone. So I'm making this easier, saying okay, these are non-primary divisions. So each AIBJ is non prime irreducible. Now, here is the focal point of this part of the proof. What do these look like, these non prime irreducibles? And when I say what does this look like, it look like A's and B's to me. Uh, what I mean is, what do they look like with respect to their prime ideal factorization? Two 
non principal. They have to be the product of two non principal products. Note, so we'll point to side note. If A is non prime, irreducible, then the ideal generated by A is P1, P2, PK. Now, that's a general statement that's true in any dedicated domain, any non zero principal ideals, product of prime ideals, and in fact, any ideals, product of prime ideals. But this is irreducible, right? And so let me point out that all PIs are non principal. If not, that would mean, let's say that capital P1 is principal. That would mean A is principal, this is principal, the rest of it's principal. So that means that A breaks down, right? It's this times whatever this principal generator is. <laughs> Everybody okay with that? So K is even. Because these are non principal primes, and if you multiply an odd number of them, you'll be back to a non principal, which is ridiculous. And in fact, k is equal to 2. Because even if k is 4, that means the idea, if you have p1, p2 is principal, p3, p4 is principal, that means the principal ideal A is principal ideal X and the principal ideal Y, and A equals XY, and A reduces. Right. A is irreducible. Am I agree with that? So we have uh, A one, A two, A M is B one, B two, B M. Let's say that. AI is PI1, PI2, it's an ideal. BJ is Q, uh, J1, Q, J2. So, as an ideal factorization, we have P11, P12. P21, P22, all the way up to PM1, PM2. It's Q11, Q12, Q21, Q22, all the way up to Q, wherever I did this, M1, Q. Uh, oh, oops. I'm sorry, that should be an M. Kind of begging the question there, all right. There we go. But prime ideal factorizations are unique. And so I'm not even going to dig too deep into the unique. First thing I know is the number of prime factors on each side must be the same. How many prime factors do we have over here? Looks like 2m. How many do we have over here? 2n. Let me make this last part sound fat, fancy. The characteristic of c is zero. So I can cancel the two, and then we'll help. go into the factorization steps. Wait, okay. The interesting part of this, I think, is the other direction. So the other direction, uh, Let's suppose let's suppose that the order of the class group is bigger than two and show R is not an object. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna deconstruct this into a couple of places. Uh, 
there exists an ideal class in a order uh, in bigger than this. Okay, so what do I have? I know I've got a I know I've got a group. A finite ability group that has an order bigger than two. Let's suppose I can actually find an element in that group of order bigger than two, right? Could happen. And what am I going to do here in this class? Uh, we'll say the class of I. This is one of the ideal classes. Order in. I pick. Uh, a prime ideal okay this is where I'm sort of using this range of algebraic integer stuff because now uh, I've certainly used finite class groups but now what I've done is I've selected a prime ideal that lives in this ideal note P to the N is principal And P to J is not principal. <laughs> so it is as small as positive power because that's in fact the order of this class in the class. Everybody okay with it? Pick Q and the inverse class of this. By the way, notice that the inverse class is distinct from class I because the order is n bigger than two. Right? So this is a different class, so I can pick up a prime ideal in this class too. This is also prime. Note that You to the end. And you to J is not for zero J four. So we will let P to the N generated by alpha, Q to the N generated by beta. And notice that PQ is principal, right? Because I picked P here and Q in the inverse class, so their product should be in the principal class. And this is generated by, say, some gamma. Can somebody explain to me why alpha, for example, is irreducible? It has a factor, it would fact that I principal idea would factor into P to J. Right. And by uniqueness of prime factorization, this should be P to the J, P to the N minus J. But there's no principal in between here, so that's ridiculous. So alpha. Beta and gamma are irreducible, all by the same sort of argument. Check this out. I think we all have to agree with that ideal factorization. This means the ideal generated by alpha, the ideal generated by beta, is the same thing as the ideal generated by gamma to the n power. So there exists a unit in R such that U alpha beta is gamma to the N. This has two irreducible factors, and this has N irreducible factors, and N is bigger than two. So the ring's not an issue. Now, there's only one case left, and that's what happens if every element uh, other than the principal class is one or two. 
See if you can figure that out, and we'll get to that next time. Any questions? Yes, sir. This might be scary to ask, but are there any analogous results to this? Like, if you give me something about the pipe group size, can you tell me anything about the ring? Yes, you can, and that's a very good question. We're going to talk about that later. We get into something a little bit more general called elasticity. Oh, yes, okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, right. It sees the... Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Other... All right. Y'all have a good one, and we will see you at least by Wednesday.